Lord, we ask that you show us mercy. We ask, Lord, that every hard place in our hearts, everywhere where we are resisting you, everywhere where pride or self-reliance or stubbornness, is in the way everywhere where our wisdom is competing with yours everywhere lord where the influence of the world or other people is competing with yours we pray and ask lord that you would overwhelm us by your holy spirit by your presence and most of all lord by your truth it is your truth lord that sets us free we thank you for that lord that apart from you we would have no hope it's your law we have transgressed, all have sinned, all have fallen short. There is not one who is righteous in their own right. And since we live, Lord, in this apostate age, we pray and ask, Lord, that you might be willing to spare us from the day of trouble that is coming on the whole earth to deliver us from deception and to keep us, Lord, from too much of the consequences that the church is bringing on itself because it has not listened because it refuses to repent because it is guilty before you lord of destroying the lives of your little ones we pray and ask lord that you would help us to be with you to walk with you to find those who are missing to bring them back by your sovereign working in us through us and concerning us as a testimony we pray and ask these things, Lord, even at this late hour, this late hour of mankind, we ask for it, Lord, that you would open up the heavens and let the rain come again on the fields of your people, even as you dry up the fields of those who hate you. With all this in mind, Lord, we remember that you are our teacher, you are our king, you are our redeemer, you yourself will instruct us, shepherd us and lead us you yourself will sanctify us by your word washing us clean and making us able to be at the wedding as the bride and not be shut out for those lord who couldn't make it tonight for one reason or another a few family crises around lord minister to them where they are speak to them where they are and especially lord for those who are on their own lord who are suffering from fear and isolation who don't know what to do, who don't know where to turn, who don't know where is safe anymore. Lord, shepherd them to safety, make new wineskins for them to gather in and pour out the new wine in those places, Lord, and send workers equipped, Lord, to help you shepherd them so that not a single one be lost of all the Father has given you just as you have promised. We ask this in your name, Lord, to be in agreement with you since you have said these things already in your word amen amen okay so continuing our series on the seven churches tonight we're going to look at the second church which is the church at smyrna now just a quick recap the only thing you need to remember specifically from last week is this bit. Do you remember that the seven churches represent two things at the same time in parallel? Church ages. So there is an age in the history of the church that is very characterized by what we learned last week. And in the same way, there is a long period in the church very characterized by what we'll talk about tonight it starts about 100 AD and it goes through to the mid 300 AD and we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute but remember it also as well as it being a progression of ages it also refers to the fact that you will always find churches that are like these seven in every age and why should that bother us because what is a church is it a building? No. What is it? It's the people that meet together. The church is the people, not the institution. You know, if you had the second church of the Holy Pizza down the road, don't laugh, it exists. It's a registered religion in New Zealand. Yeah? Pizza. 
<laughs> they worship. They say God is a pizza, and that and the up there, and they they want a slice of him. That's what they say. They've been facetious. They did it on purpose to mock religion. But anyway, it's a it's a registered religion in New Zealand. In case you were wondering, I don't suggest it as an option. If you know how quickly pizza goes off, how revolting it is the second day, I don't think you'd want it. Anyway, back to the subject. We we need to remember that none of these churches, whatever name they are, even that one, if there were no people in it, would that church still exist? No. So the buildings, the institution, the bank accounts, you know, the website, all that, is all just decoration. The only thing that's ever a church is a gathering of people, two or more in his name. So all these churches, all these churches are talking not about institutions, they're talking about people. That's why it's personal to us. Because you may not just see a fellowship or some other fellowship you know reflected in what's been spoken of. You might see yourself reflected in it. And if you see yourself reflected in it, what should you do? You should do whatever he tells that church to do. You understand? Because if you recognise that the church he's speaking to is that sounds like me well the smart thing is whatever he told them to do you do that make sense so that's why these things are relevant for us because we'll find ourselves a little bit in most of them just like the church today you'll find all of these churches re represented to a greater or lesser degree somewhere but overall can you remember what age we're in now overall Laodicea, it's the last church, the church of people's opinions. Okay, where the word of God, they say it doesn't have authority anymore, it's just that whatever people's opinions are. Laodicea, that's the age we're in now. Anyway, for tonight, we're going to look at number two, Smyrna. So, Revelation 2, verses 8 to 11. Anyone volunteering? Anyone? My volunteer sticks ready. D, do you want to let rip with that one? It's only short. Yeah. The angel of the church of Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. I know your affliction and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know that the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison for the test, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whether as he is, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Why does it say whoever has ears? Attention. <laughs> Everyone has ears. Why does it say, for those who have ears? For those that are listening, for this message. Yeah, if you're a parent, you'll know what this means. You know, God can talk all day long. There's a difference between listening and hearing. Because your kids will say, have you listened to me? And they'll go, yep. Have they listened to you? No. Nope. Why? Because their head was like way over there somewhere the whole time. They heard the words, you know, the words arrived, got processed, and went straight out the other side. Didn't stop. Because they're too busy thinking about, you know, their computer game or something that they want to get back to. It's the same notion here. God is saying, you know, even if I shout in plain language from the clouds, only some of you will hear me. Or you can put it whichever way around you like. Hear and listen are not the same, isn't it? Not just the sound, not just that you registered that he said something. It's whether you 
engaged your brain, processed it, and hung on to the part that's for digesting. You know, otherwise it's just noise. Because we all, what, why don't we listen to everything properly? There's a really good reason. You might as well think about this. Why don't we? Well, partly it's because we sometimes we don't want to hear, so sometimes we deliberately don't listen. But there's another more practical reason. Close to that. It's related to that. Should we listen to everything? No. Well, the reality is most of the noise around us is just noise. You know, you go up the escalator at the mall, who remembers the tune? Why? No one, because it's just elevator music. Your brain knows not to bother listening to that. It's just background noise to kill the silence, you know? Most conversation you have at work or at school or whatever is elevator music. And God help you if you go to a nightclub or something and sit around with a whole lot of drunk people who want to share their wisdom with you, that's highly amplified elevator music. You know, it's just noise. So our brains, for a very good reason, f filter out noise, elevator music. That's not going to, because your mind can only absorb so much at a time. You don't remember everything, you know that? That's why you can't remember your whole life, because your brain literally doesn't store it. Your brain decides what to store. Oh, that'll be useful, put that away. That's noise. So we have to actually think, I need to hear. You know, I need to chew it over and swallow the bit that's important. That's what he's saying. So anyway, back to Smyrna. If you have a little look on my very flash map there, I thought I'd just point out to you where Smyrna is. And can you see above it, or below it, is last week's church, Ephesus. And we go up the coast, Smyrna, and then above that, Pergamum. What's special about Pergamum? It has a special distinction geographically. I'll give you a clue. It's the opposite of this. Jerusalem is the dwelling place of God on earth. What's, what does the scripture say about Pergamum? Yes. It's where the throne of Satan is on the earth. Pergamum. Okay? So, but there's a Christian church there. So, the message to Pergamum is quite interesting. Anyway, Smyrna. What country is this? You recognise the shape, all you geographers? No, well, originally, this, name, this word is Greek. But it's saying in a Greek way, if you just say that middle bit, what does that say like? It's like this. Myrrh. Smyrna comes from the fact that myrrh was the main export. See, it's a port, it's on the coast. It's a very, it was a very prosperous place because it had a big port like Ephesus. Lots of trade. But its main export leaving there was myrrh, which was an incredibly expensive product. But you've all heard of myrrh. Where? Yeah. What are the three gifts? Gold frankincense, and myrrh. Why gold? Because he'll be a king. Why frankincense? It's in the same line as because he'll be a king. It's to do with that, but because he'll be a... What do you use frankincense for, especially in the Old Testament? I'll give you a clue. Think about how the word ends. Frankincense. Incense. It's the main component of the incense used in the temple. You know, the burning the incense, the smoke going up? Frankincense was the most expensive 
thing you could put in when you were making incense. It has a particular smell, right? And even today, it's incredibly expensive. Gold, because he'll be a king. Frankincense, because he'll be the high priest. How about myrrh? What do you use myrrh for? Burial. Yeah. Yes, burial. Because he'll die at myrrh. Remember when he's buried in the tomb? And then the woman go along to do what? To wash the body and to wrap it with what? Not just cl cl cloth, but with spices. It's myrrh. Myrrh is what they... They didn't embalm, but they would put myrrh with the body. It, it stopped it smelling. You know? Because remember, it's the Middle East. That's why they buried people so quickly. Because in the Middle East, in the heat, if you don't bury someone quickly, it, you know, it's not good. So, this name has something to do with myrrh, and myrrh in the scripture has something to do with death. Just keep that in the back of your mind as we look at the message, and you'll, as we go along, hopefully you'll pick it up, what the connection is. Where's this country? Turkey. It's Turkey. Okay. See at the bottom there? Anatolia? Anatolia, so that's Turkey. But in the old time, it was Greek. Who's heard of Alexander the Great? So he conquered this whole area, right? So these cities were founded primarily by Alexander's conquests. And they became wealthy and prosperous as Greek cities, hence the language is Greek, the names are Greek, it all sounds Greek. But the Romans, of course, took it over. So as these letters are written, these are all Roman places, still with their Greek names. Around 700, you have an invasion by this new force in the world that didn't exist when these letters were written. What invasion is that? It came out of Saudi Arabia. It's the invasion of... The first crusades which they called jihad it's the invasion of islam this whole area was conquered by islam when it was conquered it was the most christian place on earth because the capital of this whole area this whole area was known as byzantia Who's ever heard of Byzantine things? Byzantia? No? You have to be a history student to know this. So Byzantia was the Eastern Orthodox Kingdom. Had its own Pope and its own Emperor and its own capital, quite separate from Rome. So the whole Eastern Orthodox Church... Does anyone know how far the, the Eastern Church spread in the 1st and 2nd century? <coughs> Would you believe to China all the way to China. So this is, you, most of you in here are Asian, right? Yeah. Where's Asia? Where's Asia? How big is Asia? It's, it's massive, you know why? Because this is Asia. You guys are from Asia. South Asia. East Asia. This is the other side. Turkey is south west. This is the western edge. You guys are from the eastern edge of Asia. Turkey is the western edge of Asia. India is southern Asia. And Asia goes all the way up to Russia, which is called Eurasia. European Asia. So what you hear about Eurasian people. You know all the stands? Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Eurasians, Asia. This is, this is known as Asia Minor in the Bible or in history, but it's, it's Southwest Asia, right? This whole place got taken over by Islam. The capital was called Constantinople. Who's heard of Constantinople? 
and can you go to Constantinople anymore? Can you buy a, can you ring up the travel agent, go get a ticket to Constantinople? Well, only if you ask for a ticket to Istanbul. Istanbul is what the is what the uh, Muslims renamed Constantinople, and the largest church in the entire world. They turned into a mosque. It's the Hagia Sophia Mosque. But if you go into it today, it's so big, they couldn't reach up to the top. So even though it's got all the Islamic stuff down here, when you look up, there's all the original Christian decoration all over the big dome, exactly like in St. Peter's and that. It makes St. Peter's look like a little shack. It's massive, right? So it was so the biggest Christian place in the most Christian part of the whole world fell to the Muslims. That's another whole story. That was because of disobedience, but never mind. So that's where you're looking. All of this is modern day, what we would call Turkey. But back then, it's the Roman province of what used to be part of Greece. <coughs> It was so important, this town, because it had the bishop for the whole area lived there. What does a bishop mean? Clue, forget your Catholic upbringing. Doesn't mean the Catholic version. What is a bishop biblically? Minister. Sorry? Minister. So he's a, he's a priest, he's a minister, but what does he do? He has a special role different from a regular priest. What does a regular priest look after? A congregation, singular. The bishop looked after the congregations. His flock were the other priests. So he concerned himself for looking after the priests who were looking after the congregations. So if you like, he was his ministry was to the to the priests. And they were charged with making sure doctrine stayed sound. And in Smyrna was one of the most famous ones of all, and his name is Polycarp. So if you get a pet cat or something, or rather you're looking for a cool name, there's one for you, Polycarp. And it means, what does poly mean? Many. And this, you won't get this, is from Greek. Polycarp means many fruit, very fruitful, and he was. So his name, his Greek name, Polycarp, means very fruitful. He was martyred. He was burnt alive. But tradition says, and the historians agree, something went wrong. What could go wrong when you're trying to burn someone alive? You know, burnt at the stake. What could go wrong? That's right. That's what went wrong. He refused to catch fire. <laughs> he was ready to go. You know, he wasn't upset. I'm going to God, bye. You know, and they were very upset that the flames did not come near him. It's like a sign from God. You can't burn my guy. You know, so they had to stab him to death through the flames. Scared the life out of them, as you can imagine. So the testimony of his martyrdom spread everywhere. So they were trying to get rid of Christianity by killing the bishop. What happened instead? That story went all over the known world and encouraged all the Christians about the power of God. Had the opposite effect to what the Romans were hoping. But he died. Remember the name? anointing for death polycarp is a classic example of what this message to his church actually is about so let's go right bottom of page one let's just look at that first verse there i know your affliction and your poverty yet you are rich I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of 
Satan. When the Spirit of God, speaking for God, says, I know your reflections, there's two ways you can understand that. What's the most obvious thing that God could be saying? If I say, Holy, I know what your drink tastes like. What do I mean? Yeah, but how? Because you told me? Because someone else told me? Why? Because I've drunk that as well. This is the biblical meaning here. When he, the Spirit is saying, I know, he doesn't mean I'm safe over here watching from a distance. Like, oh, I can see what's happening to you. You have my sympathy. Why is it important to understand this? Because lots of people, when they're in, been under trial, they think that's God's position. Well, it's all right for you. You're a God. You know, it's all right for you. You're in heaven. Try being down here. What would Jesus say to that? I have. That's why I know. You understand? He's saying, I know about this. Not just because he can see safely from a distance. He means he knows what you're going through because he's been through it. And it's a bit more than that yet, which we'll see in a second. It comes back, remember we did a little bit of this last week. It comes back to this idea of echad. What does that mean? Oneness. Okay. In modern speech, you might say unity with. But oneness is an important thing because it's a plural word, remember? God is echad, plural. Three who is one. Are we like that? We're made in his image. Are we a plural being? Everyone say yes. Yes. What are you? Yes. Your body. So the tent, your soul, what's your soul? It's just your conscious, your brain, your, you know, the logic, but, and your spirit. What's your spirit? How did God make man? He took up dust, earth. In Hebrew, the word for earth is Adam. What did he call the first man? Adam. Why? Because he's made of dirt. Part from, so he formed them. It, now he looks like a man. Is he a man yet? No. What did God have to do? Breath. He had to put his ruach, his breath, in him, his spirit. Part of you is eternal. Part of you is not. Which part is not eternal? This bit. How about your brain, your memories and stuff? Is that eternal? If you get this right, you get a doctorate in something. Don't know what. Take a guess. When you go to heaven, let's assume, the, let's be positive and assume we're all going to heaven. When you're in heaven, how much will you remember about the earth? How much will you remember? Calculate it. It's really easy to add up. What's zero plus zero? Oh, zero. Nothing. It specifically says that in the book of the Revelation. It says, I'll make everything new. The former things will not come to mind. You will not remember. Once you, if you make it to be in the kingdom, none of this garbage here that you are enduring, you won't even remember being here. Why is that important? Well, if you're like me and you can't stand seeing people perishing, I'd spend eternity fretting over all the people that didn't make it. I won't remember that they even existed. God brings us literally into a new place, new. So what's the only part that arrives there that's here now? Your spirit. And he gives you a new body. 
Remember, an incorruptible body. Why does it say incorruptible? Because it's different from this one. Your new body will never wear out. Your new body can't be corrupted. Why? Because there's no sin there. <coughs> you understand? But right now, we are still in his image after a fashion. We are a triune being. Body, soul, and spirit. And it's, it's not a perfect fit to God, but it's sometimes helpful for understanding some things. To think of God being a bit like Jesus is like when he's in the body. The Holy Spirit's the, his spirit and the thinking, you know, the brain behind it all is the Father. It's not a perfect fit, but sometimes helpful to think about that. So remember Matthew 17, oh sorry, John 17, Matthew, John 17, the prayer of Jesus that he wants us to be echad with him. Remember, Father, I want them to be in me and me and them just as I am in you and you are in me. So he wants us to join him in being echad with the Father, right? Which means he doesn't want us to be sinful anymore. He wants us to be righteous. He doesn't want us to be like humans. He wants us to be like him. Remember? Sanctification is the whole thing. When is that perfected? So we're being sanctified all the time, aren't we, if we're really his disciples? So every day you're a little bit less like you were before and a little bit more like who you will be. So from the very first day, you're already a new creation. You're already not any more who you were. But you're not finished, are you? So you're already not who you were, but you're not yet completely who you will be. But let's say you reach 90 and you've been a really good Christian. Are you perfect now? No, you're still a sinner who needs grace. You still needs the... So sanctification, even at its absolute peak, it's not quite finished on earth that happens at the resurrection because if I died 300 years ago what's my body looking like now not very glamorous right so when the resurrection happens what's going to go up to the cloud a big pile of slime no only your spirit he gives you a new body and he finishes the sanctification. You are presented to his Father in heaven, perfected. The final perfecting is done entirely by him at that last stage. Which is not to say we don't need to be sanctified now and just assume you can, you know. Because the only people he does that for are those who are really his disciples along the way. Okay, so you can't just sit back sinning and think it's all right, he'll sort me out at the end. No, it won't happen. And do you remember, if you look at Matthew 19 there on page 2, who wants to read that out for us? Uh, Davina, can you read that? It's really short. So Matthew 19, verse 4 to 6. Eventually, he replied, that at the beginning, the Creator made them male and female, and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So that quote comes from Genesis 2 verse 24. <coughs> when people get married, the two single people died. So get used to that when you're married. If you try and carry on being a single person in a marriage, it'll be your marriage that dies instead. The single person dies. You become a new thing. The ultimate expression of this is the wedding of the Lamb. So after the resurrection, the rapture, which happens simultaneously with it, it's the wedding. When the bride is married to the Messiah, according to the law of God, what happens? The two become one new creation. What will change about Jesus? Nothing. Why? Because he's already perfect. He can't change. 
So there's only one part of the equation that can change. <coughs> the bride. So once she's married, she takes on the exact same nature as her husband. In heaven, we will be like him. We will be completely echad with our husband, the Messiah. Does that make sense? And you'll see in Ephesians 5 there, husbands love your wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. <coughs> washing of water. So when I get home, should I read Veronica a few verses and then tip a bucket of water over her? As much fun as that would be. I can't run fast enough to try it. So is that what it means? Washing her with water and the word? What is it, what's washing her with water referring to? The spirit. It's, so the word and the spirit is what does the washing. You need both together. Okay. So who's doing this? The husband, Jesus. So he's doing it to his bride and each man should do it to their bride. So how many husbands have we got? Daryl, Ariel, me, Jerry. So all the husbands should be and we're all guilty for not doing this, even me, believe it or not. Not we should be, even this husband here. How long are we waiting? <laughs> Don't worry. The beatings will continue until morale improves. <laughs> we should be reading the scripture. We should be sharing the scripture firstly with our wives because God works in that. Right? That's how it's supposed to be, which means, wives, what should you be doing? You should be encouraging your husband to do that. You understand? Even boyfriends and girlfriends. If you're in some kind of male-female relationship, even brothers and sisters, you know, that's God's order of things because it reflects the ultimate expression of it, which is Jesus doing it for his <coughs> girl the church right. why because he wants to be able to present her clean without blemish and without wrinkle what's a wrinkle I, now i can definitely ask my wife because her hobby is ironing so what's a wrinkle mrs t <laughs> <laughs> that's the ultimate sin on her ironing board is a wrinkle and it must be immediately ironed out. <laughs> it cannot proceed any further. It must be ironed out. Well, that's about sanctification. Jesus wants us to be able to be presented to his Father in heaven without blemish, in other words, without defect, and with no wrinkles, nothing bent, nothing twisted, nothing, you know, everything straight as intended. That's what he wants to do. So that's why the Spirit's here. That's why he gives us his word. Because the combined effect of the word and the Spirit is to make us cleaner, cleaner, cleaner. And then he'll finish it completely by marrying us in heaven. Does that make sense? I tried to think of a way of explaining how, how can I be in Christ and Christ be in me? Because that's the meaning of a card, right? Oneness. How can two things be in each other? This Holly's drink, it's the water in the cup. The cup's not in the water, is it? So we're used to thinking of one thing in another. How can two things both be in each other at the same time? I was trying to think how to explain it. And then I thought of it, in case you want to explain it to someone else. Let's imagine I go over there and I get up to here of coffee tip the coffee in and then I get the sugar and I pour up to here of sugar what have I got? I've got a container of coffee and sugar right? but what if I, and you can tell both are in the jar but they're not in each other 
this is what I've got is a container with both things in it. But what if I stir, 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 and I tip it out, and I tip it back, and I do that like 20 times until it's so completely mixed up that every grain of sugar has got a grain of coffee next to it. You know, it's like completely, completely mixed. What have I got now? Well, I've still got a jar of coffee and sugar, but now, is the coffee in the sugar or is the sugar in the coffee? They are both in each other. You cannot separate them anymore. You can't say this is the coffee, this is the sugar, because now you can't really, just, it's become this blended thing. You know, where whichever part you look at, it's completely blended. It's a new thing, not like before. Echad. One thing completely inside the other in both directions. Does that make sense? That's what God's aiming for with us, with you. Does that make sense? But you have to do lots of stirring. Is God a stirrer? Absolutely. Does he pour you out and repack you? Absolutely. Is it a fun experience? Not usually. But is it essential? You bet. What on earth has this got to do with anything? Oh, incidentally, I just had a little note there. This is why God hates divorce. <clears throat> One of the reasons why God hates divorce. Why does God hate divorce? Because what he joins, no one has any right to separate. His goal is to bring about a complete unity, not the not separation. You understand? There's lots of reasons God hates divorce, but that's primarily it. When he brings two people together, they are meant to endure all the mixing, all the pouring out and repacking, and not grumble, but cooperate with him because it's, why? Because it's fun? No, because it's for their good, because it's part of their sanctification. Yeah. Should we ask our marriage specialist again? Another question? <laughs> Describe the ideal woman to me. Because she's not here, so... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Describe that, or shall I ask Andrew? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay, we'll get, ask the professor, Daryl. <laughs> Describe the ideal woman that God would choose for you, since he did. What's that? Ah. It's related to that. And it will take all night for you to get it, so I'm just going to tell you the answer. The ideal woman for you, if you're a guy, is the woman that will drive you to Christ, that you can't deal with unless you get your Christian life in order. You understand? Most guys think, well, I'm the head of the house. She can just do what I say. But they're completely unqualified. Completely unqualified to be head of the house. God will usually give a Christian guy a, a girl that will press him into God to survive, to cope. Why? Because God wants him to grow. God wants him to be the head of the house, but he has to learn how. You understand? He won't. The ideal wife is the woman that will drive you deeper into God in order to be the husband. You understand? So what should wives and girlfriends be doing? encouraging their poor hopeless men because that's what most of us are to go to God's school and learn how to be godly husbands why because that's how God covers you spiritually your husband is your covering so if he's made of plastic better hope it's not a hot day so you should be encouraging your men to 
assume the role God intended them for. That's partly why you're there. That's why he chose you for them. But it's not like you're in the perfect seat either. What problems do women have? And it's to do with Smyrna. Women have difficulty staying in the role that God intended for them. Women like to drive. Which is not God's order either. So what should men be encouraging their wives to do? Or their girlfriends or whatever? They should encourage them to be godly women. To have the beauty of holiness and to make it easy for a woman to do that. What does it say about husbands and wives? The man is a head over his wife. Most guys stop there. What does the next part of the scripture say? It says, wives submit to your husbands because a man is a head over his wife. Most guys will quote that. See, God says, I'm in charge. What's your reply, ladies? It's the next part of the scripture. Husbands, you should take your lead from, I'm going to paraphrase so it's easier to understand. You should take from your lead from Jesus who, being God, having all the authority, laid his life down for her. You exercise the authority God gave you for the benefit of your wife, for the protection of your wife. It's the same with pastors and congregations. Any relationship where it's Jesus and the bride reflected. Does that make sense? So if you're a bossy woman, you make it impossible for a husband to be to lay his life down to because it's not laying his life like giving up authority. It's not that. For him to survive being Christ like, you have to be a godly woman or you'll kill him. But the reverse is true. For her to be a godly woman, she has to, and to be submissive, it has to be safe for her to do that by you being a godly man who lays his life down for her sake. That's what perfect Christian marriage looks like. Do you find that very often? Not usually. Why? Well, no one teaches it anymore. No one even knows what they're supposed to be aiming for. Another subject for another day. Smyrna. What's all that got to do with anything? Well, a lot. What does he say here? We're at the bottom of page two. I know your affliction and your poverty, etc., etc. We're just going to focus in on the first bit. The word for affliction is thalipsis. When you're in the original language. Have you heard that word before? You, you have heard it in here. Can anyone remember what thalipsis means? Or you can cheat and read it there. Philipsis means what? It's the same word as in Matthew 24, speaking about the end times. Philipsis is trouble, affliction, where you are on the receiving end of unpleasantness, sometimes a great deal of unpleasantness. It's the same word, Philipsis. And God's saying, I know your thalipsis. How does he know it? Well, John 15 is going to tell us. Who hasn't had a go? Diane, do you want to read John 15 starting in verse 18 for us there? It just goes over the page slightly. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated you before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its time. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep me also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. What does Jesus just say? The world is going to love you. No, the world is going to hate you. 
Why? Because you're horrible? No, he tells you specifically why the world is going to hate you. Why? Because it hated him. Echad. When the same people that hated him hate you because you belong to him, you are having unity with Jesus. You are having a Christ-like experience. You are having the same experience from them that he is having. Why is this important? Because it's really important. It makes the world of difference. Really tune in now. It makes the world of difference. If you understand that he is on the receiving end of it with you in real time. The spirit in them is attacking Christ in you because it hates him. What you're enduring, he's enduring because it's really aimed at him. He's letting you have a truly Christ-like experience. What sort of people hated Jesus? The Romans? No. Remember the Romans had to be convinced to crucify him. Remember? They were like, what? What's he done? They'll oh, send him to Herod. Send him anywhere. Don't send him here. Because they were like, what? Go away. We're not interested in any of that. The Romans weren't interested in him at all. They only crucified him really, really reluctantly. How do you know that? When Pontius Pilate pronounced the death sentence, what did he do immediately? He washed his hands and he says, the blood of this man is on your heads. My hands are clean. In other words, you've crucified him, not me. Because he still couldn't understand what this guy is supposed to have done. He still couldn't comprehend it. No? Does anyone know something about Pontius Pilate's wife that morning? What did she say to him? She had a dream, a really disturbing dream. She says, don't crucify that guy because if you do, something terrible is going to happen. And it did. She knew. No. What then can we say about suffering, Philipsis, if the reason you're suffering is because you're a Christian? Where is God in the picture? Where is he? In here, with you. Suffering with you. Not sitting remotely, because the Greek idea of gods, who's watched any of those corny movies like Hercules or Clash of the Titans or whatever, or the, um, that chocolate ad, whatever, with those, uh, anyway where the gods all live on top of a mountain and just look down at poor little mankind there in a kind of indifferent way and just go, oh, look at those little ants down there. Well, you know, whatever. That's the Greek view of the gods. Is that our God? No. Where, he, where is he in our trouble? He is in it, in us. And what he's telling us here is you are going to have trouble you are going to have thalipsis because you belong to me. Not because of anything you've done. Simply because you belong to me. The world. So who's the world? If I said the spirit of the world, who are we talking about? Satan, isn't it? This is the main. Remember, we're the goldfish in the shark tank. This is not the kingdom. The kingdom's still coming. So firstly, should we be surprised then when trouble comes? He promised us it will. So how are you going to cope with it? Well, the first way, the first and most important thing is what I just said. To understand that he's not sitting indifferently or remotely on some hilltop observing you at a distance saying, Oh, it's okay. It's okay, Faith. Don't worry. I can see. I can see. You know, I'm coming sometime. I don't know when, but, you know, just have faith, faith. 
And if you need more grace, she's right behind you. Okay? It's not like that. The reason he says, I know your thalipsis is because he's right there in it, with you, in you. So important to understand. It changes your whole perception of, is God abandoning me? Why has he left me? He hasn't left you at all. He's in it right in it with you. Why do they hate me? What did I do? The answer, nothing. You don't have to do anything for the world to hate you other than belong to Jesus. That's enough. That's enough. And of course, we know from what Jesus said that a time will come when your enemy will be the people of your own household, meaning the church primarily. Why? Because that's who the enemies of Jesus were. The Romans weren't that bothered. Who were the ones who were always trying to kill him, arrest him, do something with him, shut him up? The false religious people. The Pharisees, the, Sar the um, Sadducees, the scribes. Why? Well, because he was really bad for business. Everything was sweet till he turned up. You know? They could say whatever they like. The people just believed them. You know, and the people bought the sacrifices and the money and everything's good. And they had the nice clothes and the big temple and everything. It's all great. Then a scruffy shepherd turns up and starts tipping the money table over and telling them they're all sinners and they're not going to heaven. And that if you and that you've betrayed God. Oh, we haven't betrayed God. We're the priests. He's saying, no, you're not. God's priests <coughs> obey God. You guys have made your own version up to suit yourselves. How did they react? We need to get rid of you. The very same people, the children of the Pharisees, if you like, are in the church today. If anyone gets up and tells the truth, you will find out where they are really quickly. They will try and silence you pronto. I know, I have all the scars to prove it. Anyway, to comprehend better what's going on, we need to have a look at what happened Remember how Israel, uh, the map's roughly like this. This part of old Israel, Jerusalem's about mm, there, and the Jordan's like that, and the Sea of Galilee's about there somewhere. This part of here, with Jerusalem in it, what did you call that? You called that Judah. All this other part up in the north was called Israel. And remember it split and you had two kings. You had the king of Judah and you had a king up here and his capital, so this is sometimes called Samaria, okay? Where the Samaritans come from. That's why the Jews hated the Samaritans. Samaria. Up here, instead of using the temple here for the sacrifices, he, this king built his own temple at a place called... No one knows? Bethel. Which is kind of strange how Bethel Church now is such a problem because they're doing exactly the same thing, making up a religion that conflicts with what God has said. Well, it's exactly what they did up here. And he, they tried to create their own religion, copying what happened here, but at Bethel. Why can't you do that in the Old Testament? Because the law said the sacrifices had to be made at the place, the dwelling place of my name, Jerusalem. You can't just randomly set up your own plastic religion, which is what they did. How did God deal with them in the end? Cutting a long story short, there was these people over here who were no one at all. They're quite tiny. Assyria. God empowered them to invade. These guys are much bigger than these guys. So who won? These guys. Why? Even though they're not Jews, God was on that day, God was with them. Why? Because these are judgment. 
God empowered a foreign agent to crush Israel. Israel vanished. If you heard of the missing ten tribes, that's what it means. The ten tribes here ceased to be identifiable. They were taken into exile and scattered throughout the Assyrian Empire and they basically ceased to exist up to now as like unique tribes. These, there's ten up there. Where's the other two? Judah and... We need one more, don't you? That's only eleven. Should be, there's another little tiny tribe lives here. Benjamin. Benjamin. So Judah and Benjamin are here. This guy that invaded, it actually happened over quite a long time. I won't try and write his name. You can read it here in Second Chronicles. See there? After this, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, sent his servants to Jerusalem. Why? Well, because he and his God had just done this. Look. All of this is now Assyria. That whole region was now part of the Assyrian Empire. It had ceased to exist as a Jewish place. All the Jews were exported out, almost. What do you think he lined up next? He thought, this is easy. If you were Sennacherib and you invaded here, you believed that this isn't just a war between your troops and their troops. It's a war between your God and their God. What did the Israelites say the name of their God was? Can you pronounce... Oh, what is it again? That's right. yod he vah -he. yod he vah -he in Hebrew. But that gets English smoothed out to Yahweh. It's just the sound of the word, of the letters yod he vah -he. Okay? Yahweh or Jehovah if you're a King James. Okay? The Israelites still called the God they were worshipping. They still used his name. But it wasn't him. They just put God's name on something they invented. Does that happen today? You bet. Does it still happen at Bethel? Especially. But if you're Sennacherib, you think you've already defeated yod heh up here. So he thought, if this is the same God down here, no problem. So look what <clears throat> happens, because this is important for our understanding. Actually, because it's a lot of reading, is it okay if I just summarize it, and then you read it after? So what he does is he sends his army, and he sends his messengers ahead. And remember, we think of countries now, but back then it was more like city-states. It would be like fortified cities and then the land around them. So Jerusalem is like a massive fortress on the hill with these massive walls, big iron gates, bronze gates, really hard to get in, right? But he thinks, it's a breeze because I just knocked these 10 northern tribes over, no trouble at all. He thinks it's him, his cleverness, his skill as a great commander, his very good troops, and his God. Who's his God? Anyone know? Well, the first thing is it's plural, in a whole basket full, including the one I loathe personally the most, which is um, Astaroth. Ishtar is the same thing, in a, which is a, a, the main goddess that they worship there, which is all to do with sexual immorality and witchcraft. And it's the, that is who Jezebel worshipped. So when you understand what God did with Jezebel, it's for worshipping Astaroth. But also Nisroch and a bunch of others. That So the Assyrians had a whole basket full, a bit like the Egyptians, you know, that whole collection. So he sends messengers, and in Jerusalem they shut all the gates like you do when another army comes, and you put your troops up on the wall, and normally what would happen is, when you worked out the right time, you would open the gates and you send your army out into battle to, to 
hopefully defeat the invader. Because you can't live in your city all the time, all your farms and that are out there, right? So Sennacherib so sends his messengers, and this is the message, just paraphrase, this is the message he gives them. My master and his God, it's really important, that, say, so not just Sennacherib, but and his God, have just defeated every other place and their gods. Because it wasn't just the ten tribes of Israel, it's all these other tribes all out around here. The Assyrian Empire was huge. No one could stop them. They just came from nowhere and knocked over everything. And then he says to them, now he and his God are going to defeat you and your God. Inside the city is the last really good king in the line of Jewish kings. Anyone know his name? Hezekiah. Okay? The last really godly Jewish king before Jesus. What does Hezekiah do? Does he go up on the wall and say, oh, I don't think so, you wait there, I'm coming out the box your ears for you. Because I'm stronger and my God's stronger. Does he do that? No. What does he do? He fasts. He prays, he puts on sackcloth and ashes, he humbles himself. He does the exact opposite of what Sennacherib's doing. No boasting. He doesn't rely on his own strength at all. In short, he responds to the false god and its servant by turning to the true god as his servant. So though he's the king, he humbles himself to the lowest thing before God and then he sends to the prophet of the day which was Ishiyahu Hanavi, Isaiah the prophet and says go before the Lord and Sennacherib was sending letters, written messages you know, so he gives he sends the messages to Isaiah and says go before the Lord and ask the Lord's instructions about this, these insults okay and then when you read these things later, um, you will hear God's reply, because it's, and this is the part that's so important for us to get. He says, tell this to Sennacherib. This is what the God of Hezekiah and the God of Judah says. You think you defeated all those other people and their gods. Do you not know that it was I myself who empowered you to do that? Me. I sent you. Why? It's judgment. Is Sennacherib a servant of Yahweh in the normal sense? No. He's a what? He's a tool. You know, he's an instrument of judgment. <clears throat> he worships a false god, a demon. But Sennacherib doesn't understand it's God, our God, who sent him and caused him to win. But then he says, but now you've come and stood at the gate of my dwelling place and hurled insults, not only at my people, but at me. He says, therefore, I myself am coming out to fight you. Since you think you can beat me, I myself am coming out to fight you. And Isaiah said to the king, this is what God says, the army of Judah must not go out. You must stand and you must not answer them back. You must not speak. So not get into a debate with this demonic force. Nothing to debate. Speak to the hand. Because, why? Because God's decided what's happening and that's it. The conversation is over. So Hezekiah commanded the, the troops on the wall to not speak, to not respond to the taunts and to not go out. And the sun went down and then the sun came up and what did the sunrise reveal? 185,000 Assyrian troops dead with no battle 
And the reason we know the Bible's reliable is the Babylonians over here in modern day Iran, they knew about it and they wrote it down. So there are, a, there are Babylonian stella, a stella is like a, a huge granite stone that they would write on. So there are Babylonian stella that record exactly this from their perspective of observing it. They weren't involved, but they observed it and were terrified at that the God of the Jews of, of Jerusalem was able to go out and destroy this army without the actual army going out of the gate. God just went out and did it himself. Why? Because what he says to Hezekiah, the insults thrown at you have fallen on me. Therefore, I myself will go out and fight them. Why is this important to our Smyrna story? Because it's always that way with us. What does Jerusalem represent? The dwelling place of God on earth. Where is that now? Everywhere we are. Remember? He dwells, the new temple is the is a living one. We are living stones of the temple. God's dwelling place on earth is in the innermost being of every disciple collectively around the planet, not just in a building in Jerusalem. So when Satan attacks God's dwelling place, the same thing happens. Does Satan have permission to mess with Muslim places, Buddhist places, Hindu places. Can Satan do what he likes there? Absolutely. Does he have God's authority? Absolutely. But it's different when he thinks in his arrogance and pride, because Satan's character is reflected in Sennacherib. Pride, arrogance, I can do anything, God can't stop me. Look, look at all my success. I've corrupted the whole world. I've got them worshipping all sorts of lunatic things. Even pizzas. You know? So Satan's got such a big head he can't find a hat to go on it, you know? So he gets so cocky that in the end he turns his attention to God's dwelling place. It's the one last place he hasn't conquered. That's what happens right at the end of church history the time that Matthew 24 is talking about. The ultimate philipsis, the ultimate uh, struggle, is when there's nothing left for, con for Satan to conquer that he hasn't already conquered, except God's dwelling place on earth, the thing Jerusalem represents, us. So that's why at the end there is that time of ellipsis that the church goes through do you understand why God wants us to understand this you will not endure that unless you understand that you are like Hezekiah in Jerusalem where's God in the picture he's in there with you literally in here with you so what Satan does against you God takes personally because it's now Satan's having a go at him his response is exactly as it was with Sennacherib he rescues his own people and then he comes out himself to deal with them how does he come out himself to destroy the army it's the second coming he literally comes himself remember that the armies of antichrist will have Jerusalem surrounded the Christians are long gone by now just the remnant of Jacob in there. God literally turns up and destroys the army of Antichrist just like this. Does anyone know from the book of Thessalonians how he destroys the army of Antichrist? How big a battle is it? In a blink of an eye, it's over. 
As soon as he appears, it's finished. See, he destroys them by the brilliance of his coming and by the breath of his mouth. It's <coughs> over as soon as it starts. Bang. Because really, it's no contest. Make sense? All this is repeated. But for you and for me, the bit God wants us to understand is when the Thalipsis is happening, we have to think like Hezekiah. This is the enemy trying to attack the place of God dwells on earth in me and in you and each other. So collectively, we need to do what Hezekiah did. We don't fight the darkness, we turn to the light. We don't think that we can defeat that in our strength. We have to turn to the one who will go and defeat it himself for us, for his own name's sake. Because he takes it personally when his own dwelling place is attacked. Does this make sense? And most of all, where is God in the picture? With you, not sitting safely on some mountaintop observing from a distance. All of that gets us right the way to page six, I think. But do read those scriptures that'll fill in the blanks because I just gave you the Cook's Tour version. Any questions? Does that make sense? Okay, but do read the scriptures. It'll, there's other bits in there, that, but it's all easy. I'm just going to make a, a comment. Um, how we get on? That's tell me get on. Okay. And you all know what Armageddon is, but it actually takes place below, which is called the Valley of Jezreel. Yep. Jezreel means God sows. Even today, they will not build on that valley. Yep. Yep, that's where the last battle takes place. But there. Okay. So just one final note you'll see at the top of page six. As righteous as Hezekiah was. And God rescued them, and so Assyria was never able to conquer Judah. What happened when Hezekiah died? He got replaced by one of his sons. What was the son like? A loser. Why was he a loser? Because he learned nothing from watching his father. And he behaved exactly like the king of Israel and started to do in Judah the things they had been doing in Israel. And then the kings after him did worse, worse, worse. So instead of learning the lesson and realizing that God had protected them, but he had handed them over, you would think, how could you miss that lesson? Wouldn't that really be, have you like, you know, quaking in your boots saying, oh, please, God, not us. No, no, direct opposite. They got a big head. They got a big head thinking, oh, well, see, the Assyrians couldn't touch us. We're special. That's what you hear coming out of the Pharisees' mouths. We are Abraham's sons. We are God's delight. Nothing can touch us. But there's God in front of them saying, no, you're not. You're a pack of vipers. You're like dead man's tombs. You're all shiny on the outside. Nothing but bones and you know maggots inside. Same thing happened in Judah. And in no time, they started embracing the same kind of rubbish that had got Israel into trouble. So God started again. He sent them more prophets, most particularly Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Yirmiyahu, his name is in Hebrew. To warn them all over again. And they, and they kept saying, Do you see what happened to your pals? And here you are doing the same thing. Repent now, or God will do even worse to you than he did to Israel. Did they listen? As usual, no. Did God do what he said? Yes. What did he do? Should know this by now. Did he use the Assyrian again? No, this time he used Babylon. Why wouldn't he use Assyria again? They worked before. Been yeah. Why had they been defeated? Because God is just. He used them, but their nature is pure evil. 
So to make sure the world knew that whilst he used them, he wasn't for them, after they'd served their purpose, he caused the Assyrian Empire to be absolutely destroyed. Absolutely. About 50 odd years before the Babylonian <coughs> invasions. So he made sure that the world knew that he was for Judah, but he wasn't for Assyria. He just used it. You know? Why is it important to understand that Babylon came next? Because Babylon comes next for us. This first invasion is like what happened 20 years ago. All the churches that were already doing the really stupid stuff, when the Toronto blessing and stuff like that came, which was completely satanic, that was just Assyria coming again. And it swept those churches away as easily as Assyria swept the ten tribes away. But there were churches that were like Judah who went, that's not God, not in here. And God protected them, didn't come in. What's happened 20 years later? Now, most of those churches, the very churches that resisted Toronto, are all doing Alpha, which was designed to get you into Toronto, etc., etc. So we're just repeating. We're just repeating what happened back then. So you should expect that two things will happen. First, God will deal with all that rubbish because he will destroy Assyria. And that's beginning to happen. He's beginning to destroy the, the power, authority and achievements of all that rubbish. So there'd be like a tiny breathing space where some survivors can come back and whatever. But ultimately, because what, stand, what Judah stood for, which is like the remnant that stood the first time but now have rebelled, Babylon is coming for them. Is this like, oh, just got back from Assyria and now, oh God, we're invaded again? Nehemiah, oh sorry, not Nehemiah, Nahum. Nahum promises no. Nahum is the one that prophesies the destruction of Assyria. And God says, I will bring back the captives and I will not permit them to be taken captive a second time. Okay, so the survivors God brings back from all that rubbish, the remnant that he'll bring out for himself, he will not let them be taken in by Babylon. Why? Because they'll have learned, to be survivors, they'll have truly learned their lesson. And they'll be as weary, as weary, as weary, and there's no way they'll do anything to attract Babylon. They've had their lesson, you know, does that make sense? Babylon's coming. How do we know Babylon's coming? Book of Revelation. The last great enemy is Babylon the Great, the kingdom of Antichrist. Okay? Babylon is coming. But for us, never forget Hezekiah and the Judeans. That is a picture of the church in the last days, what we ought to do. Remember how he said to his troops, don't go out, don't fight, don't argue back. So what would they have to do? If I'm a soldier and I'm on the wall, what am I wearing? Armour, and I've got my sword. What does that sound like? That's Ephesians 6. I'm all dressed in the armour of God. But what's the armour designed for, according to Paul? To go through the gate and attack the Assyrian? No. To stand. Why? Because the Assyrian will be defeated when God goes out and crushes it. In the meantime, we stand and refuse to go in with them. Stand. That's how you win the battle. You win the battle standing, continuing to be faithful, because in the end, he, for his own name's sake, for the same motivation as you'll read in there, the exact same motivation, God himself will go and destroy that which is trying to crush his dwelling place. Because he won't have it in the end. Does that make sense? Same thing. Jesus says, work while you have the light, because the time is coming when you, the light will, won't be there and no man can work. All you'll be able to do is, what? Stand. 
it says this calls for patient endurance. Why? Because you don't do anything right at the end because you're like the Judeans in Jerusalem you're under siege you can't take the fight to the enemy all you can do is stand but that's all you have to do because in the end he who is your God will take the insults being hurled at you personally he himself will go and end that fight does that make sense? So, he sees our affliction, our th thalipsis, because he's in it. And like the story we just rushed through, he's not only in it, the reason we're in it is because we're his. The reason we're in the trouble is because the trouble's at really aimed at him. Therefore, as we just finished saying, he'll do the, he'll finish the battle. We just have to stand. Then he says that he knows our poverty. That word poverty is the same. Remember when we went through the Beatitudes? You know, blessed are the poor in spirit. Remember that Greek word for poor isn't just like a bit broke. It's the most extreme word for poor there is in Greek. So it's, it's like blessed are the completely destitute and crushed. So when, you, so when you, your own strength and your own resources are completely zero, you're blessed. Why? Because yours is the kingdom. Remember what kingdom means? It means that the king will rule directly over you. To be in the kingdom means you are under the rule of the king. That goes back to Hezekiah. Why are you safe when you have no power? Because you are in the shadow of the king who has all power. Does that make sense? You just have to stand. He'll take it personally and he'll go out and fight the enemy for you. Well, for his own name's sake, in fact. The battle is the Lord. Stand still. Remember what Moses was told? Stand still. The battle belongs to God. I myself will go out and fight for you the same thing old testament and new he says you're rich you think you're poor but actually you're rich why because the kingdom belongs to you these people these assyrians out here they think they're so clever but you know what they're not going to heaven at the end of the story they will have less than nothing you understand so what should you not do you should not feel sorry for yourself Think about that. Why wouldn't you feel sorry for yourself in the midst of affliction if the reason the affliction is happening to you is because you're a Christian? Maybe you've stood up for God or stood up for the work at work or something. Why wouldn't you feel sorry for yourself? You're supposed to feel sorry. Who for? Them. Them. Because you know what God's going to do in the end if they don't repent. Feel sorry for them. Don't waste time feeling sorry for yourself. You're the lucky one. <laughs> If you're in affliction with him, you are with him. Don't feel sorry for yourself. <laughs> feel sorry for them. Going down page six. Now, he says, I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. This requires a little bit of understanding. They say they are Jews, but are not. Can anyone explain to me what that might mean, what it might particularly mean to us? If someone says they're a Jew, but are not, what does God mean? So, what's that? Someone claiming they're a Christian, but they're Yeah, so ultimately for us, it means exactly what Raniel says. They claim to be a Christian, but they're not. What does it mean in the old speak though? Why does he, if someone claimed they're a Jew, what are they actually claiming? What makes you a Jew biblically? <coughs> From the country? No, that makes you Israeli. What makes you a Jew? God's people. And to be God's people, you had to be in the covenant. 
this is the meaning of who claim to be a Jew. What God is saying is, they claim to be in covenant with me. Because that is the biblical definition of being Jewish. They are the people of the covenant, the people of the law. Right? The twelve tribes to whom God gave the covenants. They claim to be Jews. In other words, they claim to be in a relationship with me, in covenant. But they are not. Swing that through to the new covenant, it, you get what Raniel said correctly. It's the same thing. When we say claim to be Christian but not, what we mean is they claim to be in the new covenant, but from God's reckoning, they are not. They are not doing what he uh, required of disciples in order for him to treat them as being in the covenant. doesn't matter what they claim, does it? On the day of judgment, whose opinion is going to count? Yours? No, only his. Oh, but I'm a Christian. If Jesus says, no, you're not, what do you say next? Nothing. It's over. Uh, you know, next, isn't it? This is what he means. So if we were putting this into our, you know, he's writing to Jews, remember, so he's talking about that. But for us, it's the same thing. I know about those people who claim they're Christians in covenant with me but are not then he says what they really are they are a synagogue of satan what is a synagogue give me the easy answer first so if we go to jerusalem or even if we go to mount vic you can go and see a synagogue at mount vic what is a synagogue it's a yep so in the most common it's the building they say, oh, this, let's me, I'll meet you at the synagogue. They mean a building. But what's special about the building? What Dee said. It's where you congregate. congregate. And that's, it's, although you always see it in reference to the Jews, it's actually Greek, the word. Synagoge, which gets contracted in English, the synagogue. And it just means to assemble. An assembly point. Synagoge to assemble, to congregate. So it's just a place where people congregate. So it has no special religious connotation. You know, if you could have your civil defense synagogue. So if the, you know, in an earthquake, that's where you assemble. You know, for the fire drill, you could have your fire drill synagogue. That's, so that's just the meaning of the word. So somewhere where people assemble together for some purpose but he says it's a assembly point a synagogue of satan and the greek there is this word here satanas and it's important that you understand that this word is what's actually there where on the planet if you're a Christian, could you run into Thalipsis just because you're a Christian? Where? The answer is anywhere. Anywhere on earth. Are there Christians suffering Thalipsis right now all over the earth? So it's happening all over the earth. And if the problem is Satan himself, what's the problem with that? You have something in common with Satan. If I ask Raniel to be in that chair and standing next to me at the same time, can he do that? No. Neither can Satan. Why? He's a created being. <coughs> Satan in person, in person, the angel, can only be in one place at one time because he is a living being with a body you know he's he's only able to be in one place at a time so satan personally can't be attacking all the christians all over the world because he can't be all over the world at once this greek word here is trying to express the hebrew hasatan 
the accuser or the adversary. Okay. This in Hebrew has means the actual being, Satan, and his office, his role. The easiest way to understand this is let's say let's say Leanne's gone some situation at home and then suddenly God decides to use her in a ministry moment for someone in the street. Right? The Holy Spirit acts through Leanne and the words come out of her mouth and it's Jesus acting for that person that's standing in front of her. But where's Jesus? He's in heaven at the right hand of God. But wait on. He's acting in Porirua for that person on the street. Is he there? Or is he there? This is the same thing. Just as there is the Messiah and the office of his ministry acting through what? His witnesses. You and me. So he personally is at the right hand of the Father. But through his witnesses, the office of Messiah is acting by the Holy Spirit all over the world at once. Satan is the same. Satan in person can only be in one place physically himself. But his office, the office of the accuser, operates through his witnesses his servants globally represent him even though he himself can only be in one place where they congregate together is a synagogue of satanus a congregation of those who serve this purpose who do they accuse us. Do non-Christians have trouble because they follow Jesus? No, because they don't follow Jesus. Who does this accuser chase? Us. What will he accuse you of? He's the adversary, so he's against you. So don't be surprised when you have trouble because you have someone who's actively against you just because you're a Christian. And he has lots of help. If you're looking for a synagogue of Satan, just go out the front door. You know, or into lots of so-called Christian churches right now. He has endless help. He doesn't have to be there in person. The spirit of Antichrist is working flat out through congregations of people who claim to be Christian but are not Rather, they are congregations of people who are actually, perhaps unwittingly, but nevertheless, from God's perspective, acting in this ministry to accuse the real Christians. What sort of message will they give you? Well, they'll tell you that you're not really Christian. They'll try and get into your head and twist your understanding. They'll try and sow lies and deception and, you know, so, and do like Satan did in the garden. Why are you trying to be so good? Don't you know Christ made it possible for us to be free? You can just come to this party with me and be fine. You know? Come home and sleep with me because God loves you and so do I. Don't laugh. That happens. Ask any youth group leader. You understand? He's always attacking the bride, accusing her of not being good enough for Jesus. That's really important. He'll always attack you and say, you're not good enough for Jesus. Who do you think you are? But how did this start? I know your affliction. I know your poverty. That's God's answer to that accusation. No, no. They don't have any strength. They don't need it. They got me. They don't have any resources. Well, they don't need them. They've got mine. 
You say they're not worthy? No one is. That's why it's grace. But they're faithful to me. They're mine. So hands off. And if you attack, I'll attack you. You understand how it goes? But the accuser will always play on the weak link, us. The accuser will always play on the weakest link, our own stubborn heads and hearts. You understand? Now, page 7, almost there. So there's a few lessons to take from this. The first thing is when affliction comes, this, first thing is don't panic. Why wouldn't you panic? Because Jesus told you, if you belong to me, you will experience the lipses. So don't think something's wrong. It's, it's a given. If you're really his, you will experience the accuser, the adversary, having a go. Once in a while, all the time. Why does God let it happen? Remember what I said about the perfect wife for you? Guys? the one that will drive you closer to Christ to survive. It's kind of, I'm not uh, paralleling wives with Satan, but it's sort of a similar notion that he lets it happen because to survive, we have to press even closer. Remember Hezekiah? Mm. What did he do? He didn't rely on his own strength. He just, straight, he just went straight to the bottom line, didn't he? didn't mess around he went straight to the bottom line he said lord here i am no strength nothing i'm dead unless you tell me what to do unless you save us we're dead even though i'm the king doesn't mean anything you understand so that same kind that's why god allows it because it drives us to him if we're smart if we're like hezekiah if we're dumb we'll open the gates and go out and think that we can win this fight with this you know it's when you find out you've brought a sharp pointy stick to a gunfight, usually, you will not win. Secondly, not everyone is tested the same way, and I'll cover this in a sec. <coughs> Lastly, why does it say you will have trouble for 10 days? Why 10 days? There's two sets of days for trouble in the New Testament and in the Old the first one we just read, 10 days. The other is 40 days. Let's look at this one first because you'll be more familiar with it. What are the 40 day ones you can think of? What's, or just look at 40. Where does 40 turn up in the scripture? 40 years in the wilderness? 40 days in the wilderness for Jesus? And so on and so on. But that's enough to get you thinking, right? What does, let's look at the 40 years in the wilderness, because it'll explain to you how many people think you're going to have 40 days of affliction in your life. Everyone should put their hand up if you're a Christian. Everyone gets the 40 days, right? What is the 40 days? You have to understand that you, it began with them when they left Egypt and it didn't really finish until they entered the promised land, Canaan. What's in the middle? Wilderness. <clears throat> what did God do in the wilderness? He killed off who they were. Remember, it's only the second generation that entered the promised land. He killed off what they were. He changed them here. And the, ch the offspring of the new thing is what entered the promised land. This is your life. Egypt is the world. Pharaoh represents Satan. When you were initially saved, you left his kingdom. But you didn't appear straight away in heaven. You were here somewhere. You're traveling through the wilderness. How long did it take? 40 years. What do the 40 years represent? The whole journey. So no matter how many years you live as a Christian, that's your 40 years years the whole journey from leaving egypt until you enter heaven all along the way god will teach you about himself and he will change you and he will kill off who you were so that who you need to be can be born does that make sense everybody has goes through the trouble that they experience in the wilderness did they have trouble in the wilderness you bet everyone has this 
This one, who are you wrestling with? Your own nature and is wrestling with God. The same picture as Jacob at the, at the um, Peniel. When does he start wrestling? At the beginning of the night. When does he finish wrestling with God? At the end of the night. He has to wrestle the whole night. <coughs> right? There's another whole lesson in that as well, but it can wait for another day. But it's this, this idea that God doesn't let him go until the end of the, you know, till his day again. We're going to have this. This is different. What did it say back when we read the letter to Smyrna? Satan desires to test you for 10 days. Whose idea is the trouble here? God's? Satan's. Who's read the book of Job? How does it start? Does God go to Satan and say, I've got a job for you? No, how does it go? Satan goes to God, the accuser. That Job, you only think he's good. You give him to me for five minutes, I'll show you what he's really like. Hmm? What does God say? You can test him, but you're not allowed to kill him. What did God just do? He gave Satan a specific limited authority for a specific limited time. What was the outcome for Job? A period where you wish you were dead. But the outcome of it was what? Can you remember how Job finishes? His faith is like massively bigger at the end of the experience. His relationship with God is massively better at the end of the experience. And God restores to him much more than he lost during the battle. The only real loser is Satan who went home looking stupid. You know? The 10 days is always initiated by the enemy. Just like it says here in Smyrna. Where Satan... Specific teaching on that too. Yeah. Oh, I'll remind me that at the end because I'll give people a link to it. So, so what he's saying to Smyrna is about something Satan desires to do. And if you go back to page one, the actual scripture, it says there... Uh, uh, he says that the devil will put some of you in prison to what? To test you. Some. Not everyone will experience this. Everyone experiences this. This is God initiated. This is just normal sanctification. Wrestling with God. You know? This is different. This is where Satan gets permission to put you to the test. What kind of people do you think are mostly put to the test? Who would Satan mostly like to put out of business? It's the people that are the biggest threat to him. So people like Jacob Prash, his health, everything else, he goes through hell on earth. What does he do, give up? Hell no. Just makes him wilder, presses in harder, ministers more see the job effect that's why god permits it and you find it in john 15 i am the i am the vine you are the branches my father is the gardener branches that don't bear any fruit get cut off different subject but fruitful branches what happens to them what does the gardener do to them he prunes them. How do you prune something? Chop, chop, chop. If you're the branch, what's that going to feel like? What the hell are you doing? I just grew that. I, I thought I just made progress. And what did you do? You just cut it off. Ah, you lunatic. No, I'm the gardener. What do you do that for? So that you'll be even more fruitful than before. 
people who go through this kind of thing, God's purpose is always that. And it's the same as with Job. It's for a limited time, it's for a season, and Satan has only got authority to go so far, just like Sennacherib. He had authority to crush Israel, but he had no authority to go near Judah. So why is that important to understand? Well, if it's you on the receiving end, never lose sight of the fact that for that season, the enemy has God's authority to test you. Right? But only up to a specific point and for a specific time. And the outcome will always be Job's outcome, unless you pack it in. If you stand, if you do what God wants, you will be like Job. You will come out of the process a better branch, more able to bear fruit. That's why God allows it to happen. Does that make sense? Now, remember we talked about this being about seasons in church history? If these are to do with like persecution of a church, or well, Christians generally, back in the time of John, who's writing this on Patmos, remember, who represents the power of Satan more than anybody on earth at that time? History lesson now. Who would that be? What's the most powerful force on the planet in human terms? the Roman Empire. So who is the most powerful person in human terms on the face of the earth at that time? Caesar. Caesar a Christian then? No. What does his throne represent then? The throne of man. The throne of the creation on earth. Whose throne is that? Hasatan. The Caesars persecute the church for two reasons. They were terrified of rebellion. To get rid of the Christians, you know what this, the Pharisees did for centuries? They would go to the Romans and tell the Romans that the Christians were about to lead rebellion. That would always initiate another round of persecution. Being falsely accused. Get ready for being falsely accused. It happened to Jesus, it happens to us, it's always happened. But secondly, Caesars used to say that they were God. They were demanded that their people worship them as God, living gods. Every Roman citizen, everyone in the Roman Empire, was required to bow down and to treat the Caesars as God, or at least a God. What did the Christians do? They said, no, there is only one God, and it's not Caesar. Guess what happened to you when you said that? Persecution. Now, because you're all expert history students, have a guess from the beginning of real persecution. You've all heard of Christians being thrown to the lions. You know, uh, one of them, was it Nero? I think it was either Nero or Caligula, used to have Christians covered in tar and tied to poles when he was having parties, Nero. Nero, and he'd set them along the path into his villa, and then when the party started, he'd have them lit. So they're like literally human torches to light the paths, burning Christians to light the paths. Complete sadist. But guess how many emperors initiated persecution like that till it stopped? Ten. Ten. So in terms of a church age, this literally happened. That's 10 emperors, not 10 days. You have to understand the 40 days of Jesus in the wilderness is the same message as the 40 years of Israel. It's just 40 seasons. You understand? It's like the 70th week of Daniel. Well, the end of history didn't come 70 weeks after he said it. The weeks represent eras. Okay? So the 10 days where Satan desired to test some of you, 
actually happened to this church. Persecution at Smyrna was like full on. They were including all of it, including good old Polycarp that got set fire to, remember? For 10 days, 10 uh, seasons, persecution, extreme persecution came. Would anyone like to guess what the final result of the 10 persecutions was? So it started around 100 AD and finished a little bit after 300 AD, 360 some odd, when it really ended. What? How did it end? Spread Christianity worldwide. It's the Caesars persecuting, right? How did God end it? The 11th emperor is Constantine, the first Christian emperor. The battle ended with Satan's line of servants coming over to Christ. Meanwhile, 300 years of trying to exterminate the faith by persecuting God's servants, what did Satan get for all his work? What had started as a tiny sect of the Jewish belief in Jerusalem and a few other places had exploded to the fastest growing faith in the right across the entire Roman Empire. That's why Rome caved in in the end. They knew they couldn't shut it down. They had to join it. The persecution completely backfired on Satan because people saw the faith of those who were unafraid to be martyred. Instead of causing them to tremble, it gave them strength. You understand? That's what God allowed it. That's the next lesson. If it's you... I mean, it's not impossible that you might end up having to give your life at some future point. More likely if you're a missionary or something or in you're a, in a, live in a dangerous country as a Christian like, you know, Saudi or somewhere. But even if you don't literally lose your life, you can lose your comfort. You can lose your popularity. You can lose your job, maybe. All sorts of things. It's, and it will feel just as bad as dying. You know, sometimes if only I could just die, that seems like a better thing than having to still be here and join us, you know. But if you stand and you refuse, then other people see that. So not only is your faith strengthened, not only will you end up like Job, where God will restore much more than it cost you, but your testimony is all the more powerful. And there's another reason... Let's say Satan's allowed to do what he did to Job. Let's say he's allowed to take away all your wealth and all you can do is cling on to God like Elijah in the desert and just see what the ravens bring for you to eat. You know? Because all of your... You can't get a job, got no money, blah, blah, blah. And then God gives you money. Lots of it. What's special about that? If you know how to live with no money, you will never be blinded by lots of money. God will allow you to be a good manager of the lots of money because you know how to act that your needs can be dealt with when you have no money. You understand? That's one of many examples. So all of it ultimately is for his purpose. So again, not everyone will have a Smyrna experience. But the more fruitful you are, or the more God's plan for your life involves something really significant down the road, the more likely it is that you will have a season in your life like that. Remember, it's always just a season. It'll have a beginning and an end. And once it's ended, Satan loses his authority to go near you anymore. Same as like it was with Job. Then he finishes and he says, Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. All those churches that tell you that salvation is just by faith 
and growl at you when you try and be obedient and they say oh you're trying to be saved by works or something like this and they do who's speaking through them it's not jesus it's the accuser saying what are you doing that for you should be like the rest of the church that i've already got in the bag just believe that jesus is god even the demons do that and do nothing just kick back you know you're free to do what you like now the law's cancelled for you do what you please that's not the gospel part of the proof it's not the gospel what does he says be not have faith he says be faithful that's an action that's a verb be faithful even to death if necessary what's your reward life then he says something really important he says the second death will not touch you what is the second death flip over last page last half a page revelations 20 this is at the judgment and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever how long is forever and ever aeon aeon without ending torment day and night does that mean like you get to like have a rest overnight no so without resting without a break without an end torment and the and the word the greek word is, doesn't mean like you know being tickled with a feather no that's what happens to satan and his angels but then when we go further down that same revelation 20 we get to verse 14 then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. What does it say next? This is the second death. Anyone's name who is not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. The second death is the lake of fire. The second death is permanent exclusion from God. It's the death you don't get to come back from. Remember how we often talk about explaining what something is by what it isn't? So what would be the opposite of the second death? Would be the second birth. Everyone whose name is in the book of life is because they were born again. Those who are not born again are already dead, but they will die again permanently. The permanently meaning the option of not being dead ended. You understand jesus is saying if you are one of those who ends up going through a 10 then for those who endure faithfully who continue to be faithful he promises life and that the second death will not touch you that's super important especially at the end where the whole nature of the world becomes like smyrna where the entire church is suffers thalipsis at the end so really everyone ends up facing the 10 if you're still alive at the end so what should you do if you find yourself where it, you, you don't think it's god you think it's the enemy you're asking him what have i done and it's nothing special you know god's not just correcting you or anything it's completely unjust completely cruel and you're just on the receiving end of evil bang 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 and it's the accuser accusing you day and night your god won't save you remember sennacherib because this is what satan will say to you you're not really a christian your god won't save you he's going to let me have you you're not good enough blah 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 the same kind of things that's right the same kind of things that Sennacherib's messengers were hurling insults at Hezekiah and the Judeans that's what the enemy the Antichrist spirit will and he'll be sending people and the people he sends will be the people you can deal with least It'll be your own brothers and sisters or some of your best friend or something just give up remember remember um, Job's wife 
Why don't you just curse God and die? You know, shut up already and just die. His own wife. You know, and his useless friends that God chastised severely at the end, remember? That's what happens. So when you realise you're in that situation, you realise it's really the enemy and God's letting you be tested, you've only got one choice. You can cave in, you can run up the one white flag and just die. Or you can do what he told Smyrna to do. Stand, remain faithful. It's only going to be for a season. And for those who endure it, there's a reward. Eternal life, more, being more fruitful than ever. Your relationship with God will be a hundred times what it ever was at the beginning. You understand? So you just embrace it. You can't shorten it. You can't stop it. Because Satan is, like with Job, he's being allotted a, a season which he's allowed to test you up to a point. Does that make sense? Is it happening right now? You bet. You bet. So next week, oh, do we ha are we having the, the PTA, the parents teaching? Or do you still need two weeks again? Is it next week or? Huh? Okay, so unless they ring me on Thursday and go, in which case I will quickly get the next church ready. We will take a break and have the PTA. Um, or, or else it'll be in two weeks. Okay. One last thing, Carl and a couple of others, and Anthony Gardner are um, talking to me about maybe starting a, a, a men's Bible study on a Thursday night for those, because like more and more of them down there are starting to realise that what's going on is just like, what's this? So Carl said to them, well, if you can start to see that what's happening there is not of God, then you need to rush to God, isn't it? So. We're just putting out an olive branch, if you like, that maybe for these guys, somewhere where they can ask questions or hear the gospel. So uh, let me know, guys, because it's just going to start off being a men's thing and then hopefully we can have a woman's one as well. The only reason I haven't asked you to do that before is because you already, like Cabral's and Lagazon already have, like the, you already have your family thing so like to have another one as well might be too much but but anyway it would be open nevertheless for any guys and then maybe down the road you could have a ladies one as well but if you could just keep that in print and also um, you know the family that were here I don't know if you all saw on Facebook Steve if you saw him like wincing a bit it's not because he didn't like the message it's because he his whole intestine is like twisted he can't take food down his throat. Won't it won't go? Down. So he has to. He has a tube permanently attached. He has to eat out of a like a bag thing, and he's had like twenty operations or something. So he's a really faithful guy, and and his wife has to stay home and nurse him. So the kids are homeschooled and they don't have any money. It's really, really, really tough. So if you can just up, the, that's why I was so surprised that they came all the way from Upper Hutt to make it here, so, you know, it would have been quite a mission. So they're planning to come again next week, I believe, if his health permits. So if you could just keep them in prayer because they don't have a church. They tried churches around there, but all the churches around them have gone off into, you know, one loopy thing or another. So they just spend their whole time in their house. It's not too healthy, so... Keep them in prayer. And otherwise, who would like to... Are you looking at me earnestly because you want to pray? Yes. <laughs> Call me a mind reader. <laughs> I, yeah. Um, dear Lord, thank you for today, Lord. Um, thank you for using the word, Lord, to deliver your message, Lord. Um, 
pray, Lord, that you continue to guide us in this um, on our 40 days, Lord, and as we continue to journey towards you, Lord, and continue to learn more about you and your word, Lord. Um, that I pray that uh, everyone here, Lord, and everyone else, um, is able to listen to you. Lord, 